I'm Dr. Mary Pardee, and this is the Modern Wellness Podcast, and today we're talking about parasites, and my guest is the perfect person to talk about this with. I'm joined today with Dr. Bobby Pritt. She's a medical doctor and a professor of clinical microbiology within the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic. She serves as the chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo. Dr. Pritt received her medical degree from the University of Vermont College of Medicine in Burlington, and she went on to complete residency in anatomic and clinical pathology. She then undertook a fellowship in medical microbiology at Mayo Clinic, followed by a master's degree in medical parasitology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Pritt has held multiple leadership roles within major professional societies, currently serves as a member of the Board of Governors for the College of American Pathologists. She has received multiple awards for her educational achievements, including the Mayo Clinic 2018 Distinguished Educator Award. She has published more than 220 articles, including descriptions of two new tick-borne human pathogens in the U.S., as well as four books and 28 book chapters. She is the author of the popular international parasitology case blog, Creepy, Dreadful, Wonderful Parasites, which I'm a huge fan of. She also posts on Twitter. Her handle is at ParasiteGal, and she's on Facebook, and I will include those links in the show notes below. She also produces a weekly laboratory leadership podcast called Answers from the Lab. Again, we'll include all of that in the show notes. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today, Bobby. I'm so excited about this. We've had so many people on Instagram waiting for this episode to air too. So there's a lot of excitement around it. Well, thanks for the invitation, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. You're like the best person I could think of to ask these questions to. So I want to, it's a little bit of a different podcast where I really wanted to source a lot of the questions from people on Instagram with social media being such a place right now where people are talking about parasites, health, cleanses, things like that. So a lot of this is going to be dispelling some myths and also just talking about the real science behind parasites. But to kick it off, I think getting clear about what a parasite actually is will be helpful for this conversation. Yeah, that's a great place to start. So parasites are usually described as organisms, like another type of living thing that lives in or on another living thing without contributing anything to the survival of the host. And usually this refers to what we call eukaryotic organisms, those with a true nucleus. Usually that excludes bacteria. It also, just by convention, excludes fungi and viruses. So we're really talking either single-celled or multi-celled organisms like helmets, worms, and protozoan parasites. But the key that you just said is that it can't be benefiting the host, right? Like it can't be providing some benefit to the host. Does it have to be like pulling something from the host, like being a negative co-transporter there, or can it be just neutral. Just there. Yeah, that's a good point, Mary. It's really that it's not contributing anything, but it doesn't always have to be harmful. There are a number of parasites that we call commensal. That mean they just like hang out in your gut and they feed on the bacteria that's in your gut, but they're not actively harming you, but they're not giving anything back either. So that would be in keeping with the definition of a parasite. You also importantly mentioned some actually, some organisms have a beneficial effect and if we're talking about the intestinal tract, then we know that there are a ton of organisms, mostly bacteria, some viruses and fungi that are actually beneficial for us to have. So we're kind of this big ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. And we've talked about that on the podcast a lot, just like the holobiont and what is the microbiome mm-hmm. and how much we, we do and don't know yet about it too. So how common is it for people to actually have parasites? Well, in the United States, there are some parasites that are fairly common, but then there are a lot of parasites we do not have that other parts of the world have. So let's start with what do we actually have? They're probably things that people have heard of like pinworm. The Latin name for that is Enterobius vermicularis, very common in children. Also head lice is a big one. And if we ask for a show of hands, which we won't, it's about two out of every 10 people in their lifetime have had pinworm or 
head lice. So those are pretty common. And then there are less common parasites that we still see enough that they're reported each year to the Centers for Disease Control and P Prevention, like Giardia causes giardiasis, Cryptosporidium, and Cyclospora. These are these pesky singled cell parasites that cause diarrhea. And we usually get them if we're eating contaminated food or water. For example, GRD is common in people that go out hiking and they drink open water sources that aren't really safe for them to be drinking. Yeah, I've seen GRD or just there's been people with GRD where they're hiking. It's called the PCT that goes from Mexico to Canada on the oh. on our West Coast over here. And so it's very common in those group of people where they're drinking from streams, even if they're filtering mm -hmm. with water. Yeah. Okay, on social media right now, the message is everybody has parasites. If you have a rash, if you have eczema, if you have, you name it, you should do a parasite cleanse. Do you believe that everybody has a parasite? No, and we really, the science supports this. There are the, the things we just talked about that are common, like head lice and pinworm that people may have transiently during their life, um, but that's still only two out of every 10 children, let's say. But in the United States and Canada and most of uh, Europe as well, most of us are walking around and we do not have parasites, especially I think we're talking about intestinal parasites when we start getting into yes parasite cleanses. So now that's not always been the case. If you look back in our evolutionary history, and if you go back before even the genus Homo and Homo sapiens arose, there was Australopithecus. And sure, other primates, we probably had intestinal parasites as part of our just normal flora. And they co-evolved with us for millions of years. We know if we go back to Egyptian mummies, we can find evidence of parasitic infections. But now in the high income or developed parts of the world, we have very high levels of sanitation. And so we do not have intestinal worms or intestinal parasites as a standard, just in general. There are still parts of the world that have a lot of intestinal parasites. Those will be places where there's a lot of fecal contamination of the environment. There's not good ways of disposing of feces. It gets into the crops. It gets into the water, which is used to irrigate crops. And so there's this continuous life cycle where people are infected. But in the U.S., that really is not the case, except for some of those parasites I talked about, like pinworm, which even though it's an intestinal parasite, it's something more seen in children and just as a transient infection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned a couple of things I want to touch on. So one of those is that we used to have more parasites and, and potentially mm -hmm. helminths that were living mutualistically with us, maybe even benefiting us to some degree. Do you think that having evolved out of that with sanitation practices, do you think that there's any that we're almost like missing that would be a benefit to, to bring back? And I know that's probably a controversial mm -hmm. topic, but just your thoughts on, I guess it gets back to like, is it the friendly something hypothesis or what's the other hypothesis? Hygiene hypothesis? Oh, like the hygiene hypothesis? hypothesis? Yeah. yeah. Things like yeah, that. This is a, a really interesting area of study, active study. And there is some good science behind the idea that evolutionarily speaking, we did co-evolve with parasites and probably did have some benefits of that constant exposure. And this whole idea that maybe we're a little too clean these days and we've disrupted our intestinal microbiome so much that perhaps it's leading to some of the problems we're seeing in the Western world. And of course there's obesity, but there's also things like autoimmune diseases that you just don't see in areas that have a, a lot of intestinal parasites. The problem is that it's not just a, a clear cut story. It's very complex. So there have been people that have said, oh, I'm deficient in parasites. I must add some parasites to my intestinal tract. Sometimes people have had improvement of autoimmune type symptoms or Crohn's disease. Other people have had really serious effects from that. So it's probably that you need to grow up in a certain environment with a consistent exposure to certain types of microorganisms. And it's not like there's a magic pill you could take to just make your microbiome right again. So again, it it's complex. I think there probably is some good science to it that perhaps there were some parasites that traditionally were part of our microbiome, but we don't have a good answer as to how you would 
restore it or even if you'd want to restore that today. Right. Like how to re-inoculate safely at like a dose that's not going to harm you. And there's so many things also probably very hard to get approval from an IRB to do yes. that study, right? <laughs> there is some research that I've read and I'd love to hear your take on it. I wasn't expecting to even ask you this, but about <laughs> like whipworm with um, things like inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and it sounds like that's what you touched on there, but yeah. yeah, there's some. There's been some really interesting studies and more like anecdotal case reports, honestly, where they've used Trichuris vulparis, which is a, an animal whipworm. So it causes like a later infection and they've infected people with inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. And some people have seen an improvement, others have not, some had extreme pain. And so it's really the jury's still out on this. And I personally think this is probably a topic you've discussed before, the microbiome is this whole ecosystem that works together. And so replacing just or adding in one piece probably isn't the full puzzle. You probably need all the parts. And that would start really at birth when if you're breastfeeding, you get a certain microbiome from your mother and then it just continues throughout life. So I don't think we have quite the right pieces that we understand completely yet. Yeah, I totally get what you're talking about. And I've actually never thought of this before, but I feel like there may be something to like what is in the environment where the whipworms actually are. And there's probably guys that kind of balance them out, right? That we mm -hmm. just don't even understand yet. There are the commensal relationships that happen within the microbiome itself. So it's a really interesting thought. I think we try to like out get to, <laughs> we go too fast and then we're like, oh, we forgot about this piece though. So yeah. Well, and if we look at the bacterial microbiome in people living in, say, resource-limited settings where they maybe don't have the water supply that's chlorinated and chemically treated and filtered, they have a completely different bacterial microbiome than we do. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to pick out just one piece and say this is the magic pill or the, the piece of the puzzle we were missing. It's probably this complex interplay. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. And back to the most common parasites for people that would be in the United States, what are the most common symptoms that somebody would experience if they had a parasite and should get tested for parasites? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll touch on two that I talked about. Head lice is out of what we've been talking about, you know, itchy scalp and seen in children. Pinworm, that is an intestinal parasite usually seen in children. About two out of every 10 children will have it at some point during childhood. Usually the most common symptom, we have a very fancy name for it. It's called nocturnal pruritus ani. But if you break it down, nocturnal means night, pruritus means itchiness, and ani just means anus. So it's itchy anus at night. So essentially people have an itchy bottom, children do. And they scratch, the pinworm lays its eggs around the anal skin folds. The eggs get under the fingernails and then the children self-inoculate or they share the eggs with their friends and inadvertently and the whole family gets infected. And it's fairly common. Parents usually know about this and you can even get over the counter treatments and it's pretty quick. And usually you have to treat the whole family. You just assume everyone's infected. But that's not the kind of thing that I think we're talking about here. And other intestinal parasites that are not really common in the U.S. have very different symptoms. So that itchy anus at night, that's kind of a, a pinworm thing. The other type of parasite we talked about Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Cyclospora, those are those single-celled parasites called protozoa that you get from drinking contaminated water, like the hikers that are drinking out of that crystal clear mountain stream that looks so good, but is contaminated with Giardia cysts, or going to the petting zoo and then not washing your hands and getting Cryptosporidium. Those are all associated with profuse, watery diarrhea, a lot of flatulence, some cramping, maybe some nausea and vomiting. And if they're not treated right away, you can get some kind of ongoing crampiness, but we do have pretty good treatment for them. So that's, again, I think not what people really are talking about when they're talking about parasite cleanses. And in the U.S., because we aren't constantly exposed to things like Giardia, usually people if, if they have symptoms, it's pretty sudden onset with this really profuse watery diarrhea that just kind of comes out of nowhere. And then that triggers people to go to their provider and get treated for that.
Yeah, the all the cases that I've seen have been pretty much exactly what you're talking about. I haven't seen this myself, but have worked with a gastro gastroenterologist who has seen giardia sometimes much less commonly, but present more with bloating without the profuse watery diarrhea. But again, it's more of a tale from somebody else versus me seeing it firsthand. Yeah, and some of those symptoms can linger a little bit and people can have ongoing flatulence, which is described as extremely foul smelling, I guess, more than normal. And, you know, very distressing for these poor people that have these symptoms. And if they're not treated right away, the symptoms can linger for a while. So for people that have what we say is community-acquired diarrhea, nausea, vom vomiting, abdominal cramping, and it's been going on for multiple days, that's when you would go to your physician and get tested and treat it if appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. And so would you think it's warranted to test somebody for parasites who doesn't have any of those symptoms and maybe has eczema or psoriasis and is wondering if it's actually a parasitic infection. Yes, in that case, that really isn't associated with parasitic infections. And the types of parasites I think people are talking about when they think of this is some of the intestinal worms other than pinworm, tapeworms, trematodes, nematodes, and people have contacted me with these types of questions as well. And first of all, we just don't have those in North America to any extent, unless you've traveled outside of the country to resource limited settings where you've been exposed to parasites, like eating food from street vendors, living in areas, drinking contaminated water, you're really not at risk for any of those parasites. So someone that, let's say, lives in Illinois and never left Illinois, um, they're not going to have any of these intestinal worms that you sometimes read about. They're worrisome, and you definitely think of the poor people around the world that do have them. But living in the U.S. with our current environment, we really aren't at risk for those parasites. And people in the U.S., a lot of people that do travel, and so I yeah. think that's probably part of the concern is, mm -hmm. okay, I went abroad somewhere, and maybe I got it there, and that's why I have this going on. But it sounds like what you're saying is some those symptoms would be pretty evident. They wouldn't be low-level symptoms. Is that right? Well, it depends on the parasite. And you do make a good point, Mary. If someone's traveled, and I don't mean that they went and stayed at a five-star hotel somewhere, but that they went out and they ate food off the street and say Thailand, you know, the street food, there is a chance that they got intestinal parasites, probably a protozoan parasite, not necessarily a worm. But even still, that would be the kind of exposure that may trigger some additional testing. And depending on the type of parasite, then it could get into some more nonspecific symptoms like abdominal pain, unexpected bloating. Usually there's some laboratory findings, maybe eosinophilia, depending on the parasite. But things like you described, eczema, skin rashes, they'd have to be considered in the whole picture of what's going on with the patient, but that would be much less likely to be associated with a parasitic infection. There are some intestinal worms that cause a very transient skin rash, like the ones that penetrate your skin directly. So if you've been walking barefoot in an area where there was human feces around and in the soil, then that would be a different story. But again, your typical eczema type picture would not be uh, something that would prompt you to think of parasites. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when we are thinking of the worms that would actually be visible in the stool, what are we looking at there and where would those even be coming from? Yeah, there are a, a number of worms that people can get if, let's say, they travel and they ingest these microscopic eggs and contaminated food or water. Again, think resource-limited settings where you're not eating in a nice fancy restaurant and you're out in the population or eating street food or food made in someone's house, well, then you could potentially be at risk for tapeworms, for some of the round worms that can be seen with the naked eye, and pieces of the worms or the full worms themselves can come out in the stool, and that could be very concerning. And as a pathologist, my job in the laboratory is to work with my technologists on the bench that are seeing these specimens to help identify what they are, and also distinguish 
true parasites from what we call pseudoparasites. There's a lot of things that come out of the human body that look like parasites, but aren't like food material. Great. Let's talk about those because that's been on my list. I get, you probably get way more than I do, but I still get photos from friends, family, Instagram followers <clears throat> of what's in the toilet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what I'm seeing, I believe is something called a mucus string or a mucus cast. And they really believe that it is a worm. And of course, it's hard just from a picture to identify that. But can you talk a little bit about the things that you could be seeing in your stool that look like worms or eggs or whatever it is, but actually are? Yes, this is such a big topic. I would say that most of the things we get in my laboratory are not actually parasites, but they look like parasites. And if I was a patient and I saw something like that and didn't know better, I would be concerned as well. So I'm not surprised that this comes to people's attention. So some of the more common things, well, one of them is mucus strands, as you mentioned. And this is seen in people that have usually something else going on in their gastrointestinal tract that their body's producing a lot of mucus. And sometimes it can be very thick and ropey. Interestingly, we tend to see mucus strands after parasite cleanses, probably because you're damaging the internal lining of your intestinal tract, which is designed to work really well. It kind of keeps everything moving out. But if you do a really harsh so-called cleanse, basically just something that causes you to expel everything, your body can react by producing a lot of this thick mucus. We can identify it in the laboratory as mucus and not a parasite because we have high power microscopes. We can dissect the specimen. We can put it in hot water. It will dissolve. We can look at it and see that it's made up of mucus. And if anyone's done like a high school biology class, you know that worms have internal organs and structures. You've probably done like the earthworm dissection. If you remember that, when you start with forceps carefully dissecting these structures that are mucus strands, they just fall apart. They're very, what we call friable. They don't have actually any cuticle, no internal organs. And so that's very easy for us to identify. And I actually have a picture I can share if you'd like. I would love it. Let's do it. Okay, so let me share my screen. If you could see this here, this is my blog, by the way, Creepy, Dreadful, Wonderful Parasites. I love and the name. <laughs> a, patho a parasitologist's view of the world. I post an unknown case every week, and then I post the answer later in the week. And this was a case that was submitted to us, which ended up being mucus casts. And not only... Can you tell that it looks friable, like it would break easily? Look at this little fragment here. But there's also no clear-cut head or tail structure. It looks a bit like a worm. I would definitely see why people would find this concerning. But that's why when we look at it under the microscope, we can do those additional tests and show that it's not. Now, yeah. you had asked about other things, too. I have some other pictures I'll share with you. These are bean sprouts. No, nice. and okay. Yeah. <laughs> bean sprouts. You think of if you've not chewed your food really thoroughly and things come in, they go in, they come out, and you may forget that you just ate bean sprouts. Um, this is another case here where this is oh, actually, I don't know, Mary, what you think of this one. Well, if that to me looks like a, a gummy worm that you would get at a candy shop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it does look a little like that. It also what? kind of looks like a tapeworm. You could see these lines yes, here. Yeah. Uh, it's actually just a long strand of onion. Onion. And we were, oh, wow. we, were, we were able to show the really boxy cells of plant cells. And so we could say this is plant material. So we don't usually give it a name and say this is onion, but we'll say plant or food material. So we get a lot of these things. And so we've actually gotten pretty good at identifying things like pieces of citrus, those little juice sacks, mushrooms, all sorts of that things. Could, that could look yeah. like an egg kind of thing where mm -hmm. if it's like a little sack of, of citrus. And I've done videos before to talk about how it's normal to have some food waste visible in your stool, right? Especially if you're not chewing well, where like something comes through, yeah. we just have undigestible fibers from plants that will come out in the stool. And it doesn't mean anything's necessarily wrong with your GI tract either. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. And if you're eating like a whole food plant-based diet, which is, you know, a really good diet, then you probably will have some undigestible fiber, at least undigestible by you. But, you know, it's like a feast for those good microbes in your gut. So, yeah, and you may shed parts of that food out in your stool. And if you look closely, you're going to see it, but it's completely normal. Nothing to worry about. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I want to talk about the eggs piece. Is it even possible to visualize eggs if they're actually eggs? And I don't mean the eggs that we're eating. I mean the eggs that would come <laughs> from a helminth or something like that. Yeah. Parasite eggs, like helminth eggs, they're not visible with the naked eye. You have to look at them microscopically. They're so teeny tiny. You wouldn't even be able to see it if you had super good vision. You need a microscope in order to see them. So like you, I get a lot of pictures sent to me pretty much daily because of my social media presence of people's stool. They'll send me like pictures of things they've seen that are concerning. And I do have people tell me like, oh, see these eggs. And I try to gently explain, well, you can't actually physically, you can't see eggs with the naked eye. And like you mentioned, little citrus juice sacks, little seeds. I've seen quinoa before come out and we were actually able to section it and compare it to real quinoa and do side by side. And I actually published that. <laughs> it's an interesting paper on quinoa, but yeah, they look like little, if you didn't know better, you'd think, oh, that's a little egg, but it's just a little piece of quinoa. I can imagine the titles you could have for your papers being pretty, oh, yeah. pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Quinoa, corn, red pepper, skin, I've seen. I mean, there's so many things that will naturally show up in the stool and can look a little weird once they've gone through the GI tract as well. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about testing. So somebody is really thinking they have a parasite and hopefully it's because they have some of the symptoms that we've been talking about. One of the comments that you see on social media is you have to do these cleanses because you can't even tell if the parasites are there because the stool tests are so bad, it's going to miss most parasites. What are your thoughts on that? How accurate are they? Is there an accurate way to actually diagnose so people can feel good about the fact, okay, I have a negative parasite test. It means it's negative. Yeah, the tests for the helmets that you would actually expect, I think the ones that people are, are concerned about, let's say if you traveled and you got some intestinal helmet infection, those are best diagnosed with the routine OVUD parasite exam. We call it the ONP. That's your typical stool test. But there are some caveats. You need at least three specimens to be examined for maximum sensitivity. And that's not three parts of one stool specimen or three specimens on the same day. You actually want to collect different specimens on different days because parasites can be shed sporadically. And we have really good studies to show that you'll detect up to 99, 100% of most parasites that way. And so that's actually a good test when it's done well. There's some caveats. If you've just done an enema, especially a barium enema, you need to wait a certain period of time before collecting stool. If you've taken antibiotics, that will inhibit some of the protozoan parasites, those little single-celled organisms. So you'd want to wait some time after taking antibiotics. But otherwise, the ONP is a pretty good test for intestinal worms. Now, interestingly, some of the parasites that are actually common in the U.S., pinworm, Giardia cryptosporidium, I would not recommend the ovum parasite test. Pinworm, for example, I mentioned the female lays her eggs around the perianal skin folds. And so some people may recall this from their childhood. The best way to detect it is the scotch tape test or just the cellophane te tape test where you apply tape to the perianal skin folds and then look for eggs. So there's some special circumstances like that. Giardia is best diagnosed by an antigen or a PCR, a molecular method, looking for the organism's DNA. But if you are truly concerned about intestinal worms, especially if you've traveled to an area where they're endemic, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Southeast Asia, et cetera, and you've exposed yourself to them, then the oven parasite test is the gold standard test. Yeah. And the test, the ovum parasite is available through commercial lab companies, even the three day that you're talking about multiple mm -hmm. days, like we do it through Quest Diagnostics. And then there's now a PCR test too, to look for the most common <clears throat> things like Giardia and things like yeah. that. So 
All of these can be done through most commercial labs that are available. Yeah, that's correct. My laboratory does them and we're a commercial reference laboratory. There are several commercial reference laboratories. So if you go to your local laboratory or your local physician, they can collect a specimen that then gets sent to the larger reference laboratory for testing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so when people are doing parasite cleanses, I think some of these are going to be like a combination of taking herbs like, like black walnut and artemisia and things like that, which do have some properties that we've seen be mm -hmm. antibacterial, antifungal. But when they're doing these and they're seeing something called a, <clears throat> what they're labeling as a mucoid plaque coming out. So I just watched an Instagram video that was up and she's doing a colonic and she's saying, oh, look at all the mucoid plaque that's leaving my body because I've been on this cleanse for a while. And like, you need to get this out of your body. What's your interpretation of something like that? Yeah, I don't think that represents a parasite. From our own experience, we've seen a lot of that mucoid material submit it. And as I said, when we've dissected it and looked at it, so it, it's clearly not a parasite. Now, is it something that needed to be cleansed and expelled out of the body? I don't believe so. I think it's actually probably an effect of the cleanse that was being done, especially if you're using chemical substances. And by chemicals, I mean anything that has an impact, that could be a natural substance. Some natural substances are, are quite harsh. And if it has an irritating or deleterious impact on the intestinal lining, it can cause your intestine to produce a lot of mucoid. And I think that's probably what's happening when you're expelling all of this mucus after a parasite cleanse is it's just happening because of the cleanse. It's not like there was mucus there before, unless someone has pre-existing intestinal disease like ulcerative colitis. Of course. Yeah. So also with ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, you can definitely see mucus mm -hmm. in the stool more commonly. Even with IBS, sometimes when people have had mm -hmm. bouts of like diarrhea, you can see mucus come out. And I think what they're talking about with mucoid plaque is, you know, some people will say it's like this hardening that can happen around the lining of your colon or your intestines, and it builds up over the years and you need to be able to get it out or else you have this formation. And from my experience, I've worked with a gastroenterologist. I've actually been in the room with a bunch of colonoscopies and we would see it there, right? If somebody's done a prep for a colonoscopy and they've drank the solution and they've moved things through, if there's a plaque there, it would be visible upon Absolutely. endoscopy. And I just made a video the other day where it's like, then we would see colonoscopy reports that would say mucoid plaque intact in the descending colon. And that would just right. be common <laughs> language that we would talk about. And it, it's never there. We, I've never seen it. I've, and I've talked to mm -hmm. gastroenterologists, they've never seen it. And so I really believe it's one of these fallacies that comes about, but I think you make a really great point where I do think that there's excess mucus formation in some of these really harsh cleanses. And even if they don't feel harsh, if like some people will say, I felt great. And I think there's, can be reasons for that of just, maybe you were constipated and like that can feel really nice not to be constipated anymore. But that actual act of the cleansing, creating irritation to the colon, producing mucus mm -hmm. versus helping to clear it out if it was already there. Yeah, absolutely. And like you, Mary, I've seen a lot of colonoscopies and it's not something that we ever see. Never. In patients that it's not like mucoid plaques build up over time and you routinely see them in people. That's just not something that happens. Again, yeah. if you have... Crohn's disease or an underlying intestinal disorder, you may have ulcers and mucus, but that's a completely different story. For the average person who is eating a healthy diet and, and feels just fine, they don't have to worry about mucus building up in their intestine. Yeah. Okay. These are directly from Instagram followers. I had people submit questions for you. And so I want to go through some of these. The one that came through a few times, is it safe to eat sushi or is there parasites in most sushi? Okay, so this is one of my favorite questions because I actually see a good amount of parasites that come from fish. The short answer is it is safe to eat sushi if it is prepared correctly. And in the United States, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, requires that any fish that is going to be served raw be frozen first. And you have to freeze it for a certain period of time at a certain temperature. If you're going to do this at home, you want to freeze it in your consumer grade freezer for at least a week. 
say if you caught a bunch of raw fish and or fresh fish and you want to make pickled herring or something. But the sushi restaurants, they should have access to more of those commercial freezers that get very cold and you could do a flash freezing. That will kill all of the worms and therefore it would be safe from the parasitic standpoint. Having said that, not everyone does this. And I also know of a lot of people who eat fish or sushi that they've made at home. And so I have a lot of cases on my blog, if anyone wants to go and check them out, where people have sent me pictures of all sorts of fish with live worms in them. And I do have one to share with you now. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. So I have a feeling no one's going to eat sushi after that. <laughs> I know. This one is actually not sushi, but it was some lovely salmon that this was given to me by, by my colleague, Dr. Sue Woodier. She's a microbiologist in New York City. And the patient had cooked this salmon, although I have to feel like the outside looks a little bit more cooked than the inside. But anyway, they had leftovers. They refrigerated it overnight, took it out and reheated it the next day. And this is what they saw. Wow. And you can see it moving around. I have a whole bunch of these cases on my blog where people have found moving worms in their fish. You know, it's a fact of life. Fish are wild creatures. We talked a little bit about how even ourselves back in our early days of evolution probably had parasites. It's just a natural part of evolution. And so when if you're going out and you're getting wild caught fish, they probably have parasites. So you just need to know how to properly cook or prepare any fish that you're serving for yourself or others. Yeah. And have you ever watched the TV show Alone by any chance? No, I don't think I've seen that one. So basically they send all these people out into the wilderness and they are killing their own food. And it, it's just fascinating where it just makes you realize, wow, I mean, me personally, I feel very sheltered watching this TV yeah. show where, you know, we're not killing our own food. We're not seeing how there are worms and like squirrels or like things that are moving around. And so this is of one of the, like you said, it's a part of life and good mm -hmm. to be aware of. So we prepare our food properly. But sounds like, do you eat, would you go to a sushi restaurant and eat raw salmon? So salmon is one I actually avoid because I've just seen too much, yeah. um, although it's probably fine. But I will eat raw ahi grade tuna. That's usually pretty safe. And then I'll eat the cooked stuff like the shrimp and the, the eel. But I try to stay away from the raw stuff. And I have to say, I actually am adopting more of a whole food plant-based diet anyway. So I'm starting to get away from the raw fish regardless, which that has its benefits as well. Yeah, for sure. Do you think parasite cleanses are a scam is another question that we got in from Instagram. And why are they so popular now? Yeah, you know, scam is a like a harsh word, I, I do think they are a scam in the sense that if you're doing them for parasites, as we discussed, most people don't have intestinal parasites. So it's a scam. <clears throat> it's a scam in that sense where uh, you really don't need to do a parasite cleanse to get rid of parasites or get rid of mucoid plaques or anything like that. And as we discussed too, I think the structures that are being expelled are probably mucus strands and food material. So I, it's not something I think is regularly needed. Your intestinal tract actually takes pretty good care of itself as long as you're eating a, a healthy, balanced diet with a, a lot of fiber. Yeah, absolutely. And another question we got is, are ancestors dewormed regularly? So like this belief that we had ancestors that would do their own parasite cleanses, does that mean we should deworm like yearly for maintenance as well? You kind of touched yeah. on some annotation before. But. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure what they mean by ancestors, but it is true. Back in the 1800s and 1900s in the United States, we didn't have as good a sanitation as we did today. So there were people that had hookworm and whipworm. And as we improved sanitation, those worms, those parasitic infections have largely gone away. So what our ancestors didn't really apply to us, we also had malaria back in the 1800s in the United States and people don't know that, but we don't need to like take pills against malaria just living in the US now. Um, 
Now, for people who live in settings where they are exposed and get intestinal parasites quite regularly, let's say a, a child growing up in a slum in India, well then, yes, that probably would be recommended. It wouldn't be a parasite cleanse. It would be that they would take a medication that specifically targets intestinal worms probably on an annual basis, knowing that the child is going to get reinfected right away, but you just try to keep the burden of worms down by doing a regular antiparasitic treatment. But that's a completely different situation than what applies to most people living in the U.S. today. Right, 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 right. And how do you know if you've actually eradicated mm -hmm. a parasite is another question we got in. Yeah, most of the treatments that we have for parasitic infections these days are quite good. So you don't really need to do additional ther or additional testing after you've been treated. Let's say that you did go somewhere and you ate raw meat in Ethiopia and you know later passed part of a tapeworm. You can get a drug called Preziquantel, which is very effective. You will probably pass the rest of the worm, which is, I'm sure, very disturbing. But then it's gone. On and you don't need to worry about that again. So in those types of situations, it, it depends on the worm, but usually the treatment is quite good, quite safe, and then you don't have to worry about that particular infection again. You just, if I was that person's provider, I would counsel them on avoiding eating raw meat, especially in a country where they don't necessarily have the inspection and the meat inspection process we have here. Yeah, great point. Somebody else asked, are natural supplements to get rid of parasites effective or do only medications work? Yeah, this is an interesting question because natural supplements have active ingredients. So they also should be considered medications if you think about that. And many of the medications we use are natural substances. So I think sometimes people get confused and they think natural is good, but as you mentioned, like Artemisia, that's one of the best drugs we have for malaria to this day. It's commonly known as wormwood. It's a natural substance, but we've purified the active ingredients and we use it to treat malaria and it's one of the best active substances we have. So I guess I would say all natural substances if they have active ingredients that could be considered a medication, it's a treatment. So you have to be careful. The other caveat for this is the source of the natural substance. A lot of the over-counter supplements, you know, not all of them have what they say they have in them or to the degree that they say that they have. And there have been some really well done studies that have actually gone and measured the active ingredients that are supposed to be in over-the-counter supplements from like really well-known manufacturers. And some of them didn't even have any of the active ingredient. So with all of those caveats, I would say it's best to get if you have a if you truly have a parasitic infection diagnosed by a reliable laboratory test then i would stick with the purified substance that you know is going to actually kill that parasite so that's usually where you take the active ingredient and purify it and you know how much is present in it rather than trying to take a cocktail of natural sub substances and not really knowing what's in there and not knowing if you're taking a, a dose that might even be too high and have bad effects or too low and not be effective at all yeah i love how you're talking about mm -hmm. the quote unquote herbs as actual medications. I mean, they do have active ingredients in them and the mm -hmm. big distinguishing factor, or I should say one of them in the United States is the FDA regulation on the nutraceutical industry is non-existent, right? Mm -hmm. Where we just don't know what is actually in that product. I did a whole course on supplements and I covered this where they have done studies about what's on the shelf and what's actually in there. And sometimes yeah. it's very surprising and it's yeah. hard to really sift through that because branding and marketing is almost everything and it could look really reputable and there could even be somebody behind it that's reputable but we just don't have the regulations to ensure that it actually is what it says it is and I think this is an entire podcast in and of itself <laughs> um, but I think it's so fascinating that we forget that a lot of the medications that are through pharmacies, things that we actually consider medications that are FDA approved are derived from natural substances. Like we have penicillin, right? Oh yeah. 
The list goes on and on. We have blood pressure medications that came from natural substances. We have things from other fungi and um, even things from venom that have been purified mm -hmm. to get a substance that is now helpful to us. And so it's just fascinating how we forget, oh, white willow bark, you know? Yeah, aspirin. <laughs> Right. Aspirin. Yeah. yeah. Willow and bark. how great is it that we can take aspirin now and know the exact milligram dosage so we don't take too much, we don't take not enough, and we have that, but it's purified to just the piece we want in there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about this as well. There's a drug called avermectin. That's what ivermectin came from. And avermectin is a drug against intestinal worms. It is. It was only produced by a certain type of bacteria found in a single type of, in a single soil sample from Japan. Yeah, thank goodness we have the purified form and that we've now taken avermectin and made it into ivermectin, which has less side effects and is much more effective so that we don't have to just take soil samples from Japan and wonder what else may be potentially harmful things you're eating in that soil sample as well. So that would be my recommendation for people who truly have a, a diagnosed parasitic infection is to get an active drug that they know is at a safe level that isn't going to harm them and under a, a healthcare provider's orders and, and yeah. care. Yeah, that's been proven that the dosage should actually be effective too. So you're not like mm -hmm. kind of crossing your fingers so that this thing is gone. Absolutely. Okay, Herxheimer reaction is something that is talked about. And somebody asked, is the die-off phenomenon real? When you think you have a parasite, you're doing a cleanse. And I can explain that more if you haven't heard of it too. Yeah, we use the term Herxheimer reaction in allopathic medicine and talking about you treat something and, and then you get this effect. I would say in this case, though, the way I think it's being used from how I interpret it is that if there's not really a parasite present, then there's no die off. So if you're having some sort of phenomenon after doing, let's say, a parasite cleanse, it's probably from either uh, the good benefits of doing a cleanse, like if you're constipated and you just flush that out, or it could be from negative impacts of doing a cleanse if you used chemicals or compounds that have a harsh impact on your intestinal lining. But there's nothing about die off if there's no organism present to begin with. Yeah. Somebody asked, does low iron with heavy periods means somebody has a parasite? And I picked this question because I had a bunch of other questions that were similar to this in terms of this one symptom. Does it mean that I have a parasite and the symptom is not diarrhea and bloating? Yeah. No, in the U.S., there are a number of reasons why people would have low iron, and it's almost never a parasitic infection. That's not to say that some parasites can't cause low iron, and in places of the world where hookworm is very common, that would be one of the more dangerous side effects. But there are all these other reasons that there are low that people may have low iron. I would say go to your healthcare provider and get a workup if someone has low iron, because it could also be bleeding. That could be from a uh, colon cancer, or it could be low iron from heavy menstrual cycles. And that's kind of, I would say, a diagnosis of exclusion. You wouldn't want to just say, oh, it's heavy periods. I'd get worked up for that, but it's probably not a parasitic infection. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. And what's with the full moon and parasites? So people are saying you got to treat parasites when there's a full moon. Is there any scientific backing to this? Do you know where it came from? I don't know where that came from. I, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I think that the moon's effects obviously on the planet and the tide and all of that might have some geological properties and maybe even on people, but in terms of parasites and when to do a cleanse, I don't think there's anything to support that. Okay. Blastasis hominis has been one that I think is interesting. And somebody asked, do you believe that this is a parasite? And if it's found, does it need to be eradicated? Yeah, this one's very interesting. And we don't have all the data on it yet. So Blastocystis hominis, it's a single-celled protozoan parasite. It is a parasite. Well, 
we think it's a parasite in that it lives inside the body and takes things from us. And there's a question of whether it gives back anything in return. For a while, people were starting to think it was a harmful pathogen. And if you detect it blastocystis, then that was bad. You should eradicate it. But now there's a body of evidence that's growing, good science showing that people that have blastocystis may actually have, it might be associated with good gut health. So I would say the jury's still out on blastocystis. Finding it isn't cause for immediately getting treated. Some physicians will just, you want to take the whole patient into mind and say, is this patient having any problems? Was this an incidental finding? In some people, blastocystis might cause symptoms. And so if there's nothing else going on that's causing the patient's symptoms except blastocystis, that would be when treatment may be considered. But there may be a lot of us walking around that have good gut health. There are, in Europe at least, some studies have shown that a large percentage of the population that are doing really well have blastocystis. Yeah, interesting. And I read about it probably five years ago, and I was hoping you had the final answer for me today. <laughs> well, there was just a study that just came out that was uh, showing a significant portion of people that were healthy with really good gut health that had blastocystis. So maybe it gets back to that hygiene hypothesis that it's actually good to have a certain mix of bugs in your intestine. I wouldn't go out of my way to eradicate it is, I guess, yeah. the message. Yeah, really interesting. And it ties us back to where we started, where it's likely this kind of idea of who's in our microbiome, what is the balance, and maybe they're talking to each other and depending on the players could go one way or the other, maybe. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Awesome. This was so informational. I know people are going to take a lot from it and I just really appreciate all that you're doing. I remember finding you, I was looking for photos of mucus casts online mm -hmm. <laughs> and I stumbled across the website, which is parasitewonders.blogspot. And I'll put that in the show notes, Thanks. the creepy, dreadful, wonderful parasites. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I need to talk to this woman. <laughs> <laughs> is who I've been looking for. And if you guys are interested in this stuff, the blog is awesome. She goes through cases. If you're a practitioner in the world treating people with GI issues, it's so educational. The photos are amazing. I'm definitely hooked. And so just thank you for what you're putting out. And your Twitter is awesome too. And we'll put all of that stuff in the show notes. And, and thank you for being here today. Well, thank you, Mary. It's been such a pleasure talking with you and I learned from you as well. So thank you for the invitation.